Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beard of Device Pilot, and here today I'm very delighted to welcome Peter Hiscox, who is co-founder and chairman of Podpoint until 2020. Welcome, Peter. It's a pleasure to be talking about uh, an exciting story. Yeah, so maybe to kick off with, we could just cover how you got involved in um, smart energy. I mean, was, was Podpoint the first thing you'd done in, in the energy space, or was there something else that came before? No, Podpoint was the first thing that we did. Um, Eric Fairburn was a student of mine in 2004 at uh, the, uh, uh, the Judge Business School at University of Cambridge, uh, where he was on, on uh, several entrepreneurship programs. Um, and he and a fellow student came to me with an idea in 2004 for setting up a supercar club. And uh, I helped them write the business plan, I helped them raise money, and I ended up as chairman. And we ran that club until, um, two th until August 2008. We had, it was called AQE 25, we had 25 supercars. Um, we sold the business in 2008, we could see that things were getting rocky, and three weeks after we sold it, Lehman Brothers went bust and the whole market collapsed. And uh, we were very pleased we got out when we did. Um, Eric uh, had to do six months uh, golden handcuffs to show the people who bought the company how it worked. And then he went on holiday for months to sort of recover with his wife. They went to Australia. And when he came back, he said, Peter, I've, I've seen, um, I've, I, I want to change track. This is Eric, not me. Eric said, I want to change track. I, I believe that it's really important that we develop ways to save uh, carbon dioxide being produced. And uh, I know quite a lot about automobiles. And it's in the UK, you look at automobiles and they represent, depends on whose figures you use, 24, 28% of CO2 is produced in automobiles. And it's probably the single quickest, easiest change to make. So Eric came with this idea. He'd been in Australia and he'd seen the Tesla sports car based upon the uh, Lotus Elise. And he'd said, I think you know, electric cars are going to happen. Um, Edison had been a great support for them back in the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century. But uh, this now is the time. You know, Tesla's shown us this really can work. Uh, uh, and so this was now the middle of 2009. Okay. So was that, was that the, the founding date of Podpoint then? Yes. Uh, it, uh, I, it, it had a slight um, precursor called InfraCharge, but, but basically middle of 2009 is when uh, what, what became Podpoint started. And that's, um, that's pretty early to start an EV charging company, isn't it? I mean, how many EVs were there even in the UK at that point? There, there was no EV uh, electric vehicle business in the UK. There were a very small number of, um, oh goodness me, just slipped my mind, um, the Indian, uh, I might have to edit this bit in. I'll remember the name of the uh, Indian cars. They were... Um, Tata or...? Uh, well, ta they, Tata made them, uh, but I'm just trying to remember. They looked like an inverted bathtub and they had half a ton of lead acid batteries in them. Uh, and they had a very short range and they went very slowly. Um, and they, they had, there were probably 20 or 30 in the UK, but there was no established electric vehicle business. Uh, and all the people who had these, um, the, these very primitive electric cars charged them up uh, from their electric socket in their garage. Gosh, so uh, way, way ahead of, ahead of the market then. I mean, that's quite a brave, uh, brave it, leap, it, isn't it? It was, and if I go back to our business plans of 2009, 2010, you know, we were projecting a very rapid growth of electric cars. Um, that didn't happen according, you know, as our plan had predicted. Um, we weren't the first electric uh, vehicle charge company in the UK. There was another company who beat us by about ooh, 12 months, I guess, uh, called Electromotive, and they were based in Brighton. But uh, they were um, they weren't run by an engineer. Uh, they were run by a photographer, and he he liked the idea of electric cars, and he had a very nice design, but it wasn't terribly practical, and it went out of business in a few years. Um, but let me just come back to the the, the drivers. You know, Eric 
um, had by this point, we'd run this supercar business, which is really about, you know, excess. And um, he realized that's not the way forward for the world that we actually, and, and his, he came up with this driving mission, which was to develop transport systems that don't damage the earth. And that was the business mission for Podpoint. Um, I, uh, now, I live on the earth and I want to see, uh, you know, carbon dioxide levels reduced as well. But my principal reason for getting, well, the, a really important, probably the most important re reason for getting involved with Eric was that he's a fantastic manager and he's probably one of the best business managers I've ever worked with. And so that was a really key driver. Um, I wanted to work with him again. Um, and I believed that, that this was going to happen and this was going to be a really major business. And uh, uh, electric charging was the missing element in making this happen. Yeah. OK, so a hell of a leap of faith in 2009. Um, and, and it has all taken longer than you thought, but uh, it seems like it has unfolded the way you, you thought it would. Um, so I'm going to ask you to do something impossible, which is to condense more than 10 years of your experience at Podpoint into you know, a few minutes. Can you just kind of give us a, a broad, you know, sort of uh, not, not blow by blow, but just a quick sort of romp through through those 10 years in terms of the key kind of moments um, of the evolution of the company? I mean, was it all about EV charging from day one and, and just how did it evolve? It, it was all about EV charging from day one. And... Um, uh, so I uh, taught people, I've, I've done a number of new ventures, so I understand what I believe are some of the key principles you've got to get right. And one of them is you have to move with speed. And so we went from the concept to engineering drawings in about mm, three weeks. Uh, we then developed a 12 inch wooden model as a prototype to show what it would look like uh, in another week. And then we developed a a plastic full-size model uh, of our charge point uh, in another month. I've so, heard uh, Eric, I think when I visited the offices once, he said that it was inspired by a lampshade. Was it an Ikea lampshade or something, the original design? It, it, it could have been. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to quote, quote um, Guy Kawasaki, who is a, uh, a great entrepreneur and supportive entrepreneurs in his book you know 10 rules for revolutionaries uh, he says be 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 quick be shitty and uh, our it's i'm not giving you any secrets when i say that our first design uh, which drove straight from our prototype was poor in terms of one of the most critical elements for things that sit outside that's waterproofness and uh, so we sold um, a very small number of these uh, councils in 2000. We, we had people like Boris Johnson, mayor of London, saying in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2010, saying that uh, there would be 25,000 charging points in London within 18 months. Well, that didn't happen, but you know we were spurred on by, and some councils did buy uh, charging points uh, from us, even though there were almost no electric cars. Uh, I remember the name of the uh, Indian electric cars. They were called G Wiz, and there was a very small number of them about. The first really fully developed electric car was um, the uh, Nissan Leaf, and this was launched in, I believe it was 2010. It might have been 2011. And in the first year sales in the UK, they sold 865 units. So we thought we would sell, uh, as we were the, the really only electric charge uh, recharge company there we thought we'd sell 865 units but what we found was that most Nissan Leaf owners went into their house into the garage and charged it up in the in the garage so we, we had an important discussion with Nissan and Nissan were worried about this because an electric car takes more power than anything else so um they were worried that some people might cause fires in their house and their garage by overloading circuits and so they wanted people to have a dedicated charge point that had safety devices built in and was designed to take the current flow. Um, so we worked with Nissan on this and gradually, bit by bit, it took a long time. We uh, persuaded people to, when they sold a car, 
to sell a charger. Um, so, but this all happened quite slowly. So the business was started in 2009, and it wasn't really until about 2016, 2017, that the business was really picked up, driven by uh, consumers buying a larger number of electric cars. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the first five years, uh, six years of the business, we had very, very small volumes of electric cars being sold. So we wanted to um, survive uh, and keep going until the market picked up, which we, which we kind of knew it would. I, I used to have friends of mine constantly sending me emails saying, oh, hydrogen cars are going to win or fuel cell cars or this or that. But actually, when we looked at the technologies, we really believe, uh, as, as has been proven, that electric cars will be certainly for the next 15, 20 years, the principal um, uh, uh, direction in which uh, automobiles are going. Um, but we knew we had to hang in there and survive. So there were several important elements. One was we had to manage our money very carefully. So, so Eric did that, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. But also we wanted to develop uh, good relationships with the OEMs, with the uh, automobile automotive charge companies. Um, if I go back to 2010, 2011, 2012, one of the principal buyers of charge points were local authorities. And what we found is that local authorities are quite difficult to deal with. They, they don't really understand the product. They've been told by government they have to do this. So they want to tick a box for the lowest price possible. And um, we, uh, after dealing with them for three or four years, we made a decision that we would actively avoid working with local authorities and focus principally on the uh, OEMs, the auto, the car producers. Um, so th there, there are different markets. There's what we used to call street markets, which is you know where it, it's uh, probably bought by a local authority uh, or maybe a car park or a company uh, and a home product, which is the uh, a product that you buy uh, and it fits on your driveway or in your garage or somewhere where you can charge your electric car at home. Um, the, the larger street product, which looks a bit like a sort of modified um, uh, uh, parking meter, is much more expensive than the home unit. Um, the, the, the key issue with the home units was you had to install them. Mm -hmm. uh, and when uh, the level of car sales was, you know, in, uh, you know, tens or a small number, hundreds of units per year, who wanted to buy a charge point um, across the country. It meant if we were going to do this, we would have to have an engineer drive one day to Newcastle, next day to Exeter, next day to somewhere in Wales. And they'd spend all the time on the road and very little time installing charge points. Um, so we, we used, initially, we used subcontract um, electricians to do this. Um, we asked our customers for a score rating of customer satisfaction from one to five, and we scored about one and a half. Not very good. Um, so we had a big powwow about this, and we worked out that um, we could position ourselves. At, you know, having a low uh, customer service rating was bad for, for us, but also for the car companies. If we could develop a way of having a very high rating, then we could use it as a continuation of the car companies marketing relationship with their customer so when they buy an electric car they're very excited about it they've got six or eight weeks for delivery during which time we are there and we can present this continued you know high quality interaction uh, with the car company and we reckoned that this would enable us to develop long-term relationships with the car companies and in many cases an exclusive supply arrangement so uh, we took a big gamble and we set up our own install team whose number one job was customer satisfaction. And it did mean that for a very long time until the volumes went up of electric car sales, we had engineers spending all their time driving and very little time installing. And it cost us a huge amount of money. It was the, the biggest cost element of uh, of selling somebody a, uh, a home charge unit. 
but uh, it tied us in with the OEMs. And so we have at the moment, well, when I uh, stood down as chairman, uh, we had relationships with 18 car companies and we had exclusives. We were the only supplier of home units for about 15, no, 12 of them. And that meant that we dominated the home charge market, uh, whereas we weren't so prominent in local authority buys. But we then developed a, a, um, two new sectors, which were um, uh, destination, which are people like supermarkets, um, banks, railway stations, and workplace, where uh, a workplace may want to install electric charge points because it wants to encourage its representatives to uh, use electric cars and therefore it needs to charge them at work. Um, the, it, <laughs> let, me, let me add a little bit about a key element for electric cars, which electric cars are different from gasoline cars and you, you, people need to understand it. In fact, what we found is that customers get there very quickly when they have their own electric car. But when you listen to a, a reporter on the television who takes one for two or three days, they really they have problems with electric cars so they don't understand them. With a petrol car, you um, fill it up on, uh, you know, some, on, on the weekend and you drive it all week and no problems. And then you fill it up again the next weekend. Electric car is totally different. You need to fill it up every time you stop. So you want to leave home in the morning with it full. You want to go to work and plug it in. You want to go to the supermarket, you plug it in. Everywhere you go, you want to plug it in everywhere you can, everywhere you can plug it in. And people have got them very quickly get into this habit, but it's, it's, a, it is an important element in managing how you drive an electric car. Um, and so understanding how the market was segmented was a very important element for us in growing our market space. Um, we still don't actively try to sell to local authorities, that, but it obviously is quite a big market, and, and sometimes you know, they force us into selling them some units. Um, so, but, so things were sort of 2016 or so, it seems to be when you say things started to take off. And, it, and indeed, I think that's when I had my pub point installed, uh, well before I actually got an EV. But thanks to the uh, you know, persuasion of having a subsidy from the government to, to sweeten the pill a bit. Um, but you then, yeah, you then signed up these big supermarkets and so on and, and started to do these other kinds of charging beyond just home charging. But also during that time, you were, I mean, you, you, you got acquired by EDF and, and the company just went public last year. So quite a lot of other, and there were all sorts of other things going on as well, weren't there? Um, in terms of all sorts of funding and so on. Indeed. Um, the, so uh, let me, um, the, the supermarkets became quite a, an important element of the deal. And in 2018, 19, we developed a deal uh, with um, Tesco to put, the, they had, we had some discussion with them and persuaded them it would be a very good thing to have uh, an array of electric chargers in every store because this was the way the world was going. And they wanted to do it as well to enhance their green credentials. And so we put together a deal which took quite a long time to sign off because Tesco is a big company, it has to go through many levels. But it was, uh, uh, their first, the deal was for the first 650 stores to have a, a, a fast charger and a, a small number of um, uh, ordinary speed chargers, standard chargers. Uh, and, then, uh, and for customers, the standard chargers will be free, but the uh, fast charger would be, uh, they'd have to pay for that. Um, uh, that was the biggest deal anyone had ever done in Europe for selling to an electric charge, uh, selling electric charge capability. And it really was an important step change. But the whole thing has been driven, uh, th whilst there have been government subsidies, there have been local authorities who bought some units before there was a demand. The real market growth has been driven almost exclusively by the number of electric cars sold. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would track this every month, you know, with the uh, uh, SMMT figures that come out, how many cars sold, how many electric cars, and, and was that number going up, and, and who were the biggest brands, and were they, uh, were they the people we were aligned with? Um, so that, it, it was really only about 2016, 17, that 
car sale, electric car sales took off and they have accelerated very quickly since then um, until today we're at a position that we could hardly have imagined where, you know, five, six, eight percent of, uh, of new car sales are electric vehicles. You know, a fantastic thing. It sounds like you did imagine it, but quite a long time ago. <laughs> uh, well, we did. And if you ask, you know, Eric, uh, uh, something that... that yeah, if you'd ask Eric, Eric and the team drew up a, a curve showing uh, how electric car growth would happen. And, and we did that, I guess, about 2016. And we've been almost bang on track with it since then. Can I come back and, and mention actually a critical point? In, in fact, mm. the most critical point that's enabled the growth of, uh, and success of PodPoint, and that is the team that Eric has put together. Uh, he has been assiduous in building a great a team of great people in terms at the top but uh, and i believe in my experience that the leader uh, and the top team is the most critical element for an entrepreneur to get right um but you also want to make sure that everybody else in the business understands the culture the, the purpose and objective the mission of the business uh, so that everyone is aligned and uh, within podpoint uh, we built a fantastic top team where everybody uh, knew their job. They weren't afraid to push back against each other, to check decisions, to make sure we're going the right way. Did we get everything right? No, but we got most of it right. And some of the things which we thought we might have got wrong in the short term, uh, like, you know, did we copy Chargemaster, who was our main competitor, and develop a nationwide uh, network of charge points they had mm -hmm. polar um you know that's proven not to be successful have been successful we looked at it and we thought should we do it have we fallen behind but well, we decided not to and that's actually proven uh, a very successful out outcome <clears throat> but eric was really very focused on building the team and building the right people very early on we uh put together uh, well, eric had we had a philosophy about recruiting people and uh, there's an interesting um th there was a website that took up uh, had a conversation with eric like a, a, a podcast thing about uh, how do we recruit and what do we look for in the people we recruit and and it is such a sensible straightforward uh, but very very positive and business focused way of recruiting people we wanted people not who were looking for a job we wanted people who wanted to work for podpoint we wanted people who were energetic enthusiastic they didn't need to come in a suit but they needed to look as though they'd made an effort when they came to see us um, we didn't want them to sit there like a, a potato and and wait for us to ask them questions but they would come in and say here's why i want to work for podpoint here are the things i've done you know get up write draw some things on the whiteboard that were energetic and involved and it, it has been the guiding principle for the type of people that we want to recruit we want to recruit people who really want to make uh, electric car charging work and we had a fantastic atmosphere in the office a great culture and uh, if you ever get anyone gets a chance to come to our office in banner street i know people don't go to the office so much these days but we had the traditional cool zone to chill out we had the table football tables we had the the food area we had you know anyone could bring their dogs into the office uh, it was big open plan office one of the meeting rooms we only had two meeting rooms one of them was a shed an old shed that we that well, actually wasn't an old we bought a shed unit that you put together and that was up one of our meeting rooms so it was quite fun funky funky a little bit funky but very i think the other one is a, a ski oh, a, is it a ski cabin or is that the shed i'm thinking of yes. oh, no oh, that's right we did we then got a third meeting room which was a ski gondola from uh, a, an austrian ski resort and it, it only fits four people uh, and but you know pretty cool uh, and and another thing, we had a big display of large screen televisions, which would show the performance of our sales activities that, that month, uh, that would show where our charge points were being used, how much electricity was being used, how much gasoline, how much petrol we'd saved, um, how much electricity was being generated by different ways. So that 
that all of the team had uh, an ability to understand exactly where they sat in this new ecosystem of energy saving and CO2 reduction. And, and people loved it and they, uh, they still love it. And we, you know, yeah, we had some people leave, but most people who have joined the company have stayed with it because they love it. So, um, so just to bring us up to date there, <coughs> I mean, you, um, uh, yeah, so you, you, the company was acquired by EDF, I think about two years ago, um, and then it went public at the end of last year. Any, any kind of, um, I'm sure there are lots of excitements around all that, but, um, you know, to be interesting to get your views about how that all came about. Was that something you, you sought or were they were you approached and was that all part of the plan or was it slightly serendipitous, if that's a word? Um, there was, um, so the, the actual facts, so Podpoint grew, <coughs> excuse me, a little tickle on my throat, um, and we, um, we did have people uh, asked to acquire our business probably every three or four months somebody would come along. And we had active plans for how to grow and um, you know, possibly acquire other people, even though we didn't, never had much money, but it, we always had a lot of ambition. Um, so uh, at some point um, in about 2017, um, a French energy company, Engie, bought a Dutch um, electric vehicle charge company called EV Box. Um, <clears throat> in fact, let me just step back a second. At that point, um, the EV charge companies were sort of a lot more of them were coming on the market, but they're into the market. But there were only four big companies, two in the Netherlands and two in Britain. In the Netherlands, we had EV box and uh, charge the new motion. And in the UK, we had uh, Podpoint and Chargemaster. But in the, we were about the same size then in about 2016. Um, at that point, NG, the French energy company, bought EV box for about 80 million euros. And we went, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Um, and it sort of was the first real takeover play in this area. And it made us think, you know, what could be done? Um, I hope this isn't divulging too, too many secrets, but uh, we went to BP Ventures and uh, tried to persuade them to uh, put uh, about 100 million pounds into our business and we would then acquire uh, the new motion in the Netherlands which was um, owned by a group of venture capitalists uh, none of the founders were still with the business they had business managers that they brought in from outside and we thought we could do that deal but we needed the 100 million from BP Ventures to make it happen. Um, BP uh, main board turned it down I won't tell you the full details of that that we know about because it's probably not I'm not meant to know what the discussions were uh, and so um, six months later Shell bought the new motion in uh, the Netherlands uh, apparently uh, the BP board was somewhat disquieted this happened and wondered you know, why didn't we do it and uh, until the head of BP Ventures pointed out that they'd been had that offer on the table so uh, uh, that deal with Shell was for about 100 million euros and um, so there were you know the big EV charge companies were in play and then BP bought uh, Chargemaster in the UK for uh, 120 million pounds and uh, it might be 110 but something like that so there suddenly had been this, uh, uh, this, the, this uh, range of uh, activity. And in fact, Shell came to Podpoint and tried to buy us. Um, uh, and they really tried to. You know, they got into a big uh, activity to do that. Uh, but we never got, we couldn't, they, they said how excited they were, how interested, they wanted to know all about the company and do their due diligence, but they would never give us a firm offer. Um, 
And so uh, Eric and I developed what we call Plan B, which was we knew we needed some more investment. So uh, we, we finally gave Shell an ultimatum or you know, we need a decision by Friday uh, or we're going another way. I don't think they believed us, but we you know, and were shocked when on Monday morning we said sayonara to Shell. Um, that brought in another investor, but we were still an independent company then. That was in uh, 2019, uh, March the 1st, 2019. Um, within three, three months of that happening, uh, we got uh, an offer from EDF. And uh, the, with this new investor coming in, Eric and I ceased to own uh, 50% of the business. With, with the new investor coming, we have been diluted down. And the, um, the, the two financial investors on the board said they wanted to sell. Uh, Eric and I didn't want to sell, but they did. And so uh, after a bit of a wrestle in the board meeting, it was decided we would sell the company. Th that had to go through a whole process of negotiation and stuff. And, uh, but the, the business was sold to EDF um, on uh, the 13th of February, 2020. So, you know, th three weeks before the COVID lockdown. Oh, good timing, um, good timing. Your second piece of good timing in this story, at least. Yes, so, so actually, yes. just to, 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 in terms of getting there, I mean, you had helped to fund the business from your own personal resources a lot. I think Podpoint had done crowdfunding in various sources. You then had a venture capitalist on board, at least one. I mean, it's quite a variety of different funding sources, I think, that had taken you to that point. Yes. Um, it, it, it may be worth just going through that whole um journey because yep. uh managing money and bringing bring the necessary new money on board to a new venture is critically important any new venture you know i don't think I've ever know one way it wasn't okay well sorry so let's finish off the story and then we'll go back and talk a little bit about yes yeah, sort of cash and investment and that sort of yeah. stuff so, okay. so now you're owned by edf uh, so now we're owned by edf um the uh, uh, edf uh, kept the whole management team except for me uh, they decided they, they had their own chairman. They didn't want me as chairman. Um, so I left the business at that time. Uh, although having um, been uh, critically involved in it day by day for uh, um, 10, 11 years, um, I uh, obviously have continued discussions and catching up with my friends at, um, at Podpoint. Um, and... Uh, Eric is um, Eric Fairburn, who's the managing director of the company, uh, is a fantastic business manager. But he uh, and he's very collaborative in involving other um, members of the top team in discussions about strategy, about tactics, about what we're going to do, the key decisions about where we apply resources. Um, but when he, the decision is made, he would go and uh, would not like to be uh, uh, you know, gainsaid or you know, change of decision or we need five levels of approval to make this happen or anything like that. He's, he hates that, absolutely hates it. Well, I think uh, I, I can sort of, I can understand what's coming, I think, because anybody that's ever been acquired by a big company will understand <laughs> Indeed. that dynamic. So yeah, I, I'd said to Eric, this is going to be difficult, particularly, particularly as it's a French company and the headquarters are in Paris and they have huge calls on them for capital. You know, one of the things that the uh, Pod Point business all, needed all the time was more capital. Uh, as we grew, we needed more money. And all the time with growth, we needed more money. The more we grew, the more money we needed. And um, EDF has got these huge power stations it's building, which are using up chewing up billions of dollars. They, they don't have spare money to give to Podpoint. And I talked to Eric about this and said, you know, I think you could get back to being in charge if you found a new way, a, a new route to capital, like persuading them that the business could, could do an IPO and then you could get access to capital from the market. And uh, Eric went over to France and he must have been in his super best salesman um, mode that day because he persuaded uh, the uh, he persuaded EDF that then it would be a great move for Podpoint to 
uh, do an IPO on the London main market, which has you know a lot of liquidity, plenty of access to cash, and um, you know a hundred plus million could be raised in one go, and more capital as needed into the future. And so that's what's happened. EDF still owns fifty percent; they've got control of the business. Um, but there are other shareholders in the London market brought in. And so the business uh, floated on uh, the 9th of November 2021. So about 18 months after it was acquired by EDF. Uh, and its uh, um, post money uh, valuation uh, was uh, 352 million. So, you know, uh, a big increase on, I, I don't know if I actually said how much EDF paid for us. EDF paid uh, 112 million for uh, PodPoint. Great, it's a really great investment for them. And even on a compounded basis, I hope it was all a great investment for you as well. <laughs> even over, people always talk about these overnight successes as they see things go public, but in my experience, it usually stretches back 10 years to when it all started. So, uh, and it certainly did in this case. Oh, um, well, and an interesting, character, interesting feature is that um, Eric, uh, has invested uh, a quite a number of millions of pounds back into PodPoint because we, we all had to sell our shares. And uh, I've invested a lot of money too. So I'm back as a an important shareholder in PodPoint and Eric is an extremely important. Shareholder. Fantastic. Well, and, and yes, yeah, I mean, the journey is only just beginning, I suppose, in terms of EV. So uh, yeah, well, that's great to hear. So yeah. so a theme you've touched on several times, we've gone through that that story and it's fantastic to have the, uh, the sort of inside track on it. Um, it was it was sort of cash management and um and, and indeed when i first met eric in about 2017 2016 um i remember him talking quite a lot about that at that time um i was just interested in yeah any sort of insights you have i mean your your business model at least in the early days was quite a sort of product business model so you had you had to have the cash to make the stuff before you could sell it presumably so so i imagine sort of cash flow and so on was quite challenging uh, as you were getting bigger and bigger scale can you just sort of talk a little bit about kind of how how you dealt with cash you know capital fundraising without being too diluted you know just that whole that whole journey a little bit yeah um we uh we did want to, Eric and I wanted to avoid being diluted as you know we wanted to avoid that as much as possible so therefore we wanted the business to have value as much value as possible before we went out and actually looked for big chunks of, our, of money so I put a, a lot of money well for me a lot of money in at the beginning in fact um uh, I didn't put it all in at the start there were additional calls for money over the first uh, three or four years um, and I put in probably uh, about 80 percent of my total net worth at that time total net worth wow um, and uh, there were tricky times you know we had occasions uh, I think PodPoint nearly went bust maybe 20 times um, and you know where we had tricky situations where we uh had you know, cash flow issues and um we e eric is one of the best cash flow managers i know uh, and so particularly in you know 2010 11 and 12 where sales were very few and far between we had to manage the team i there was one point i can't remember the exact year i would guess it's 2011 we asked all the staff to go on half salary uh, and until until things pulled around, and that was nine months. Wow. And we gave them options for the value of the salary they lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we sold the company, they obviously they they did very well on that. They probably had a twenty times uplift on the salary that they lost. That's great, um, but that's no small thing, is it, for most people to lose half their salary for nine months? So um, yeah. that's it, fantastic it, to hear that faith they had in the business. It is, it is, and Eric was there as well. I mean. Uh, I couldn't have half my salary because I didn't get any salary. You know, we were super mean and super lean on everything. Eric had um, a particular screen. You know, everyone these days has a number of screens. Uh, Eric had one, particularly in the early days, on with something we called the God Graph, which was the graph of doom. And, and it was just a waterfall with uh, dates going down and when money was coming in and when money was going out and when we ran out of money. And when it got so we were going to run out of money in six months, doom, 
uh, Eric would get on the phone to uh, suppliers and, uh, and customers and say, can we pay you later? Can you pay us sooner? Um, and he was wonderful at it, you know, and actually really um, kept the business going where most business would have gone bust. So it's out of uh, interest. I mean, was he able to actually close that gap to zero? Because I remember at my last company, eventually, after many years, that was something we, we managed to do. So by getting enough credit terms from our big customers, we could sort of pass them through and, and manage to step out of the cash flow uh, loop entirely. But I mean, it's quite challenging to do that. Um, we didn't do it entirely. Um, but I do remember one of our major suppliers complaining that um, he was, that they were uh, ended up as a bank, effectively a bank funding points develop uh, growth. Um, that that was uh, that was tough, tough management, and it took some tough decisions. Mm. And there were occasions when Eric would phone me up at month end, and I would lend money to the business over month end. And you know, with an agreement that I'd get it back on the fifteenth of the next month, and and that that uh, that that uh, that worked well. Um, although it was always a bit nerve wracking, um, we, we, but we could see that to grow faster, we needed more money, and we talked to we talked to lots of venture capitalists, but we we knew that the, those deals are tough, and uh, and they're always for preference shares. You're not so much in control of the business. And um, we were trying to avoid that for a while. And, and fortunately, in 2006, 15, 16, along came this new form of venture funding called crowdfunding. And it seemed to us that it would make a lot of sense. Um, we learned very quickly the critical elements of how to make crowdfunding work, which was that if you want to raise a million pounds, you secure... Uh, angels or other sources of finance for at least half of that amount of money before you actually press the button and go for the launch. So it has sort of positive momentum before so, it starts. Yeah. As it were. Yeah. yeah, you don't put all the money in day one, but over the first week or 10 days, you feed the money in. So there's this huge flow, this tsunami of cash coming in and people who look on crowdfunding go, wow, that's great. Um, you know, that's where I want to go. And we've got a great message. We're saving the world. We're doing great stuff, you know. Um, and so it was, uh, we were very successful and we did four rounds of crowdfunding. How much did you raise in total from crowdfunding? Uh, I think like four or five million. Mm. And how many of the investors do you think were actually customers or had sort of come across you as a user um, beyond just being pure financial investors? Was that, was that a factor, do you think? Um, I don't know. Uh, we didn't do that. But what I will say is that when the business was sold in February 2020, the crowd funders all made a very considerable uh, uplift. Uh, we paid them back and they got their profits. And you know, uh, out of the number of businesses that have been crowdfunded, uh, Podpoint was one of the very few to date that really paid back. Mm. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the best in terms of repayment of crowdfunders. But we got to the point where we realised actually we, we don't need you know uh, another one half million or one half million. We need five more, and so we then did sup with quite a long spoon, but still with the venture capital industry, and we raised money from uh, Draper Esprit. And uh, we negotiated a, a, a term sheet which did have a preference, uh, uh, which was for, well, they got EIS relief on it because they it looked like ordinary shares, but they did have some preference elements in it. The preference shares were that they had a one times liquidation preference. Mm -hmm. To offset this, uh, when the share price went up times three over the price that, that, that they came in at, then their shares reverted to ordinaries. So we had a mechanism to get them back to ordinary shares. Mm, interesting, so, yeah. Um, that, that was quite a difficult negotiation, but we got there. Um, so we now had on the board, uh, the board was had been Eric and I, uh, and we had owned the majority of the firm, uh, the, the great majority of the firm. Um, uh, we now had um, an external investor and uh, Draper Esprit were on the board as well. 
Um, and they were, uh, we did a couple of rounds with Draper Esprit and uh, there were on their rounds, there were some um, other people who came in on some of those rounds, mm -hmm. uh, like panoramic um, growth equity. Uh, so there was, um, and those rounds were in the order of, I think it was 5 million and then we did a 10 million round. Uh, so you can see uh, th the business was now s had sales revenues of about 15 million. By the time we got to bringing on board legal and general, which was, remember I mentioned Shell, uh, we gave them a, a deadline, they didn't meet it. So we, we had set up plan B, which was a, a 13 million investment from legal and general. And they came in at that time, 1st of March, 2019. And for the first time, Eric and I didn't own 50 over, between us, own over 50% of the firm. Yeah, legal in general, uh, people don't necessarily think of them as an investor, but I think they, they invest quite a bit in sort of infrastructure, don't they? They, they do. They have quite a, a significant investment arm. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, as I mentioned, in May, 2019, uh, we got this offer letter from um, uh, the first offer letter from EDF indicating uh, an, in, uh, an interest in purchase. <clears throat> and they replied with a full offer letter at uh, the end of July 2019. Um, and you, there was uh, a board discussion about it. Uh, Eric and I both wanted to. Uh, didn't want to take up the offer. We wanted to continue to find external funding for the business to grow it ourselves. Uh, we had, even in those days, we had a real belief that the business uh, will become um, uh, a unicorn worth a, a, a thousand million um, dollars. Uh, but the, we were outvoted by the other shareholders. And uh, the uh, so the sale deal progressed and completed on the 13th of February uh, 2020. I think some of us who, who watched that deal were, were expecting perhaps there'd be some synergy between EDF as a utility and PodPoint's business in charging people's cars. I mean, people are thinking a lot about what how those two businesses might get closer to each other in, in the future, which is actually the final topic I want to talk about in a moment. Um, but was there ever any in, in sort of intention to try and do that and for EDF to or offer tariffs or other things that sort of brought them closer to charging? Or was it really fairly, fairly arm's length? Um, I, you, you're right, absolutely on the button here, because this is a key element in this deal. But even, even before then, we knew uh, it, I've kind of positioned PodPoint as a um, as a product seller as selling a capital good, you know, a, um, a charge point. But our view from the very earliest days had been that the charge point was a mechanism to allow us, when we had enough volume, to allow us to sell other services to customers. Um, and that could be uh, some uh, networking systems, some charging systems, some knowledge about where electricity was being used, but also selling them electricity itself. Because when you have an electric car, it's probably going to be using 50% of the, well, it will use 50% of addition of what you were doing before. So it will use about a third of the electricity you use in your house. So it means here's, a here's an element which is suddenly added 50% to your electric bill. Uh, and therefore, it, you, through that mechanism of, of the charge point, could we offer you a better tariff? Mm -hmm. And that has always been looking for recurring revenues rather than just a one-off capital sale was from you know 2012 uh, uh, an objective of PodPoint and and we introduced things which which did work but were reliant on volume and you know it, we really uh, PodPoint's only just getting to the number of installed charge points that enables those value-add services really to work. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, if you 
you know, you think how many units you might have to be able to control in order to have an effect on the UK grid. You think, well, probably quite a lot. But then you remember, obviously, EV charging is, is a big load relatively compared to other domestic loads. So uh, it does add up into the into the megawatts, even into the gigawatts before before you have to go very far. That's that's really interesting. So it felt like the but that it didn't feel like during EDF's uh, ownership of the company that that really sort of came to pass in any in any particular way. Well, uh, I think it, it's, it, is, uh, it was always an objective. Some of the systems were in place before EDF bought the business, uh, and some of those are grow, you know, continue to grow, but maybe not quite as fast as uh, one might have expected. But mm -hmm. I, I know that they are front and centre of the uh, top management team at PodPoint to, to make those things happen. Because... Okay. Um, one of the things we learned is that selling capital goods, you know, is a one-off transaction with a customer. Whereas, in fact, if you can keep that customer, if as a result of selling them that uh, that product, you can offer them a range of services, um, then uh, yeah, that that gives you an ongoing relationship with the customer and ongoing revenue opportunity. And and that's what we all are, are looking for. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, PZ, you've been very, very generous with your insights and uh, recollections over quite an amazing ride. I suppose just to finish off, the world's changed a lot since since you started the uh, pod point with Eric back in 2009. Um, and, and there are new uh, EV charging companies springing up even today. Uh, and obviously, they, they exist in a different climate. They can perhaps draw on other uh, technologies or partners that didn't exist when you started. It's often the case that early companies have to do everything themselves, uh, which has got quite tough. Um, but then as the market sort of boots up, um, becomes an ecosystem, perhaps, you know, you don't have to do everything anymore yourself. If, if you were talking to somebody who's starting an EV charging company today, do you have any kind of general advice for them about ways, that, you know, things they might want to think about doing or, or things they might want to avoid based on your, you know, your experiences at PodPoint, but also any insights about how the, the market's changing and, and, and how, what will happen over the next 10 years? Um, you're right in the saying that the market uh, vertically is becoming increasingly segmented in, in terms of the services that people can develop to supply to uh, electric vehicle owners. Um, if, if somebody came to me, uh, and they do quite often, um, saying, yeah, I've got a great idea for a new electric car charger, and you know, because we painted orange and it's really exciting color, um, I would advise them not to get into the market. Uh, it, it really is a volume play. And the opportunities for uh, recurring revenue development is entirely based upon volume. And so you know, if you're starting off and trying to sell 500 units, um, you, you won't get volume until you're in the millions. And making that step is, is, is hugely difficult. Um, so, uh, and Eric and I had always viewed or considered that the, the market for hard, certainly hardware and, and even other related services uh, around electric vehicle charging is probably going to mirror the uh, mobile phone market, you know, where there is an oligopoly of suppliers, you know, a small number of key suppliers, probably across Europe, you know, four, five, six. And uh, there will be small players around the edge who do different things, but it's going to be difficult for them to break in and become a super big firm. Um, if I somebody came to me with a, you know, if, so if somebody comes to me with a, say, I've got a great idea for new for making hardware in electric vehicle charging, you know, very tough. If it's, if it's a broader offering than that, and particularly around energy management, um, then I, I believe that there are opportunities. Um, and in fact, I would sort of take a little step backwards because I think that what we're going to see over the next, certainly 20 years, is a development of a lot more uh, regional, local or domestic energy uh, generation so that people will uh, w they may get some electricity from the national grid but a lot of it they'll generate themselves uh, why will they do that because it's much cheaper you know electricity and energy is going to get more and more expensive we've just seen the gas uh, price hike there's going to be more stuff like that happening down the road and in any case all the governments nearly all the governments in the world and 
I think all right-minded people are saying, how can we burn less fossil fuel? So uh, having sustainable generation systems in our house or in, our lo in, in a, a group of houses or in a locality is, I believe, the way forward for future energy, domestic energy generation, keeping our houses warm, charging our electric cars, um, you know, producing light and all the other things that we do. And that market hasn't started. That's kind of like we were with the electric car charging in 2009. Hmm. But that is going to that is going to make electric car charging look like small fi. The uh, that is a huge huge market. Um, uh, I don't think I'm giving away a huge secret. Eric Fairburn has redesigned his house uh, where he lives in Coggeshaw uh, so that it's entirely uh, self-sufficient on energy generation. He has uh, air source heat pumps, he has photovoltaic array, he has storage batteries, and he has two electric cars. He and his wife have an electric car each. And they generate nearly... Uh, across the year, they generate more electricity than they use. And, uh, you know, there are very few days or uh, only a small number of weeks in the whole year, like two or three, when Eric and Mel have to get electricity from the grid. So that is just such a huge market. And sure, there's a capital cost of putting the, uh, this system in. But uh, Eric uh, calculates over a 10 year period, the cost of his electricity is about 2.5 pence per kilowatt hour, as opposed to 25 pence we have to pay at the moment and possibly 35 pence in a few years time. So th there's um, a huge commercial driver for this. Uh, it, I think governments, um, governments can point people in the right direction. They can give subsidies around things to help make them start off like uh, Pilgrim you said you had a subsidy for your, your electric um, car charger unit um, that was a little bit of a pointing and support for a new uh, industry starting up <clears throat> I think the same thing has to happen with uh, domestic energy generation only it's going to be a market which is a hundred times bigger than electric car charging. And electric car charging is going to be a market size in the billions very soon. So uh, if you were thinking of electric vehicle sort of energy management, I'd say interesting, maybe do that on the side, but domestic energy management is the real opportunity for the future. Great. Well, Peter, I cannot thank you enough for the uh insightful and inspiring kind of details you've given us of, of your your journey I mean it's quite amazing to think back those 10 or 11 years ago uh, all your visions and, and to see that they've come true and it's fantastic to, to hear how you've repaid all your investors and uh, you know really started to change the world which is fantastic I, I'm hugely appreciative for your for your time and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, it's been a great pleasure. And the one thing I didn't mention was that uh, device pilot has been a really important element in uh, keeping our charge points working, giving us information back about what they're doing and who's using them. So you know, uh, <coughs> the Internet of Things and in our case, through device pilot has been very important. Oh, that's so kind of you. I'm blushing now. <laughs> great to talk to you, Peter. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.